seated this time. But if you'll open your Bibles today, the book of Lamentations, the book of Lamentations. This is the book of the Bible right after Jeremiah. So if you find Jeremiah, which is right after Isaiah, you will come to the book, the small little book of Lamentations, uh, just five chapters long. And this is where we're going to find ourselves today in Lamentations chapter 3, verse number 40. Through verse number 42. Lamentations chapter 3, verse number 40, through verse number 42. Jeremiah there says the following words Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. Let us lift up our hands and our hearts to God in heaven. We have sinned and rebelled. You have not forgiven. I want to bring a message to you this morning entitled, The Heart Cry of a Prophet. The Heart Cry of a Prophet. Last Sunday night, as I got home, I began to pray about what God would have me to preach this morning uh, to kind of kick off our revival services. And God led me to the book of Lamentations. I did not know why. I've read this book many times and uh, I, I cannot ever recall coming across three, these three verses of Scripture, but as I read Lamentations on Monday morning, these three verses of Scripture just continue to jump off the page at me. And I believe this: these words from the Scripture today are words that we today as Americans, we today just as citizens of the earth, need to hear. We live in crazy times. Jeremiah lived in crazy times. We'll see that in just a moment. But the heart cry of a prophet. As we begin revival services today, I am reminded of a revival meeting that I had the privilege and the honor of preaching at Bat Cave Baptist Church up in uh, Bat Cave, North Carolina, about three years ago. The service ran through Wednesday night through Sunday morning. So I was there Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday morning. We get there Sunday morning and we're sitting there and, and the service is going on and, and, uh, and, and we're getting close to the time to preach and it's, uh, the, the service started at 11 so uh, it's actually getting to about 11.55. They've been singing for about 55 minutes and uh, Pastor David McCachran, he looked at me and uh, in that old raspy voice that he has, he said, now brother, you listen to me and when it's time for you to preach, you just preach. And I said, okay, I'll do that, David. I'll just preach. He said, don't you worry about the time. I said, y'all know David. That sounded just like him, didn't it? <laughs> uh, he said, don't y'all worry about the time. And he said, don't worry about the time. So I said, okay. And so I got up to preach that morning. It was 11, about, right at 12 o'clock when I preached. And you know me, I, I'm not a stickler on time anyway. Whether he had said that to me or not, I was just going to preach anyway. But I got up and I preached. And uh, the service I finished preaching was probably around about 1 o'clock. And right before the time of, of invitation at the altar came, I remember just something came over me. And I, and I began to ask this question to the congregation. How bad do you want it? How desperate are you for revival? Just how bad do you want it? And I continued. I don't know why that question came over me, Russell, but I just continued to pound that question. I must have said it 15 times. And finally, after saying that question about 15 times, this man, he was in the back of the sanctuary. My grandparents were there. I believe my mama was there. They can testify to this. This man who was in the back of the sanctuary, he stood up. And with tears running down his face, he shouted, I want it! I want it! And he ran to the altar. And as he was running to the altar, he turned to the people and he said, I've taught Sunday school this morning. With hidden sin in my heart. And I need to repent before all of you. And he hit that altar and he began to pray. I'm still preaching. And people began to get up. And they began to come one after another. Desperate for revival as they came and they prayed and they cried out to God. The altar call that day lasted for an hour and a half. We finally left the service that day at 2.30 in the afternoon. It's the question I ask you this morning. How bad do you want? How desperate are you to see Revival. I remember as a little boy traveling with my grandparents and my parents as they were Southern Gospel singers. And we would go to old tent meetings just like we have set up 
next door. And we'd go to different homecoming services and revival services seemingly all the time. And I can remember when the services would come to an end, Bobby, the, the preacher would stand and he would, he, would, he would have an altar call and plead for people to come and be saved. And I can remember as a little boy just seeing the altars fill up. And people would pray and they would pray and they would pray. And they would weep and they would cry. And by the time you left, you would see just a tear-stained altar. People desperate for a move of God. People desperate for revival. People desperate to see God awaken the lost from their dead state. When I think about those times, I'm reminded of the 50-day revival that we had here five years ago. And the one thing that always stands out to me about that 50-day revival is the willingness, not of everybody to come every night, but the willingness of people to come here at midnight every night. And to cry out to God in this altar and to pray. Many of you, you couldn't make it because of age and different reasons. But I know you were praying every day for God to move. And for seven weeks, night after night after night, God poured out His favor upon Second Baptist Church. Why did He do that? It's because, Russell, we were desperate. We were desperate for a move of God. We wanted to see Him work. We wanted to feel His presence. We wanted to see a demonstration and an outflowing of His power. And because we were desperate for it, God showed up in a mighty way. And so I ask you at this beginning of revival tonight, just how desperate are you to see revival in our land? You see, friends, I believe if we're going to see revival we, the church, must become desperate for revival. Desperate to the point that we desire nothing more in our lives than to see God work. So I ask you, is, are these services that we're going to have this week in your heart, are they just another series of messages that are going to be preached? You're going to come every night and complain about the heat? Or are you truly serious and desperate that God would move underneath that tent? Amen. Are you desperate that the sound would, 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 would go through the streets of Great Falls and that people, no matter who they are, where they're sitting at, would be able to hear the word preached and maybe sitting in their home be saved? Are you desperate to see God move? Amen. You see, if we're desperate for God to move, we won't worry about the heat. We won't worry about the length of the service. If we're desperate for God to move, we won't, we won't worry about the things that we can't control. All we'll be concerned about is seeing God move. Are we desperate for revival? Friends, I want you to know I'm desperate for revival. I long to see God move. I long to see Him work. I long to see Him stir once again, to save, to transform, to awaken, to revive. I believe that's the exact feeling that Jeremiah had in his heart when he wrote these words of Jeremiah 3, verse 40 through 42. He desired nothing more at that moment in his life than to see God move once again. What does he say? Let us search out. Let us examine our ways. Let us turn back to the Lord and let us lift up our hearts and our hands to God in heaven. We have sinned. We have rebelled. And you have not forgiven. There are a few things from that text this morning that I want to bring to your attention. First of all, I want you to see that Jeremiah calls out their national rebellion. Jeremiah calls out their national rebellion. Look at verse 42. What does he say? We have sinned. We have rebelled and you have not forgiven. I love the heart of Jeremiah here. You know, if you think about the New Testament, you think about the Apostle Paul and you're reminded that the Apostle Paul, he said what? I'm the chief of all sinners. And here is Jeremiah the prophet and he doesn't say you have sinned. He doesn't say, you have sinned, Emily. You have sinned, Russell. You have sinned, Roberta. No, what does he say? He says, we have sinned. Friends, I'll stand here today and tell you that I'm no innocent man. Standing behind this pulpit today does not make me holier than thou. It does not make me something, uh, that, that, uh, or it does not make my life something that you cannot attain. Friends, I want you to know of all the sinners in this room, like Paul, I'm the chief. I'm a sinner. 
Jeremiah points out their national rebellion. You see, to understand the circumstances of this text, you have to understand the circumstances of Jeremiah writing the book of Lamentations. By the time that Jeremiah comes to prophesy, you have to understand that the nation of Israel has been divided into two kingdoms. After King Solomon, the kingdom of Israel splits. There are ten tribes to the north and there are two tribes to the south. Israel to the north, Judah to the south. In the 700s B.C., the northern kingdom of Israel, they sin, they rebel against God, you can find their idolatry listed through the Old Testament. It's a horrible thing that they did, how they, how they came against God and, and, and worshipped idols and, and indulged in all sorts of wickedness and immorality. And in, I think, 722 B.C., the northern kingdom of Israel, Assyria, the nation of, or the empire of Syria, came against them and, and overthrew this kingdom of Israel. And it was an outpouring of God's judgment as he used the Assyrians to overthrow the northern ten tribes of Israel. But the two tribes in Judah, the southern kingdom, were still there. And as the two tribes in Judah, they had a, a, a chance at that moment, Angie, to repent before a holy God and to say, we see how you judged our countrymen. And so instead of going down the same path, we're going to turn our hearts to you. We're going to get rid of the idols. We're going to get rid of the sin. And we're going to follow in your ways. But instead, the nation of Judah, the Bible tells us, went deeper and deeper and deeper into sin. If you'll turn to Jeremiah chapter number 3. Jeremiah chapter number 3. We see that Judah's sin was far greater than the sin of the northern kingdom Israel. As bad as they were, the southern kingdom was even worse. Look at Jeremiah 3 starting in verse 6. In the days of King Josiah, the Lord asked me, Have you seen what unfaithful Israel has done? She has ascended every high hill and gone under every green tree to prostitute herself there. I thought after she has done all these things, she will return to me, but she didn't return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. I observed that it was because unfaithful Israel had committed adultery that I had sent her away and had given her a certificate of divorce. Nevertheless, her treacherous sister Judah was not afraid, but also went and prostituted herself. Indifferent to her prostitution, she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. Yet in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart, only in pretense. This is the Lord's declaration. The Lord announced to me, unfaithful Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. We see that Judah was nonchalant in their approach to God. Israel had sinned. Israel had fallen. They were a testimony to the world of what happens to a nation when they do not follow God, when they do not follow His commands. Friends, they're still a testimony to the world of what happens when a nation does not follow God. And Judah had that testimony before them, and instead of falling down and repenting before the God of heaven, they prostituted themselves out to foreign gods and fell deeper and deeper into sin. If you go to Jeremiah 6, or excuse me, Jeremiah 5, we'll see this highlighted there as well. Jeremiah 5, starting in verse number 20. We see the types of sin that was rampant on the streets of Judah. Chapter 5, verse 20. God says, declare this in the house of Jacob. Proclaim it in Judah, saying, hear this, you foolish and senseless people. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. Do you not fear me? Well, that's a word for today, isn't it? This is the Lord's declaration. Do you not tremble before me? The one who set the sand as the boundary of the sea, an enduring barrier that it cannot cross. The waves surge, but they cannot prevail. They roar, but they cannot pass over it. Because these people have stubborn and rebellious hearts, they have turned aside and gone away. They have not said to themselves, Let, let's fear the Lord our God who gives the rain both early and late in its season, who guarantees to us the fixed weeks of harvest. Your guilty acts have, deli have, have diverted these things from you. Your sins have withheld my bounty from you. For wicked men live among my people. They watch like fowlers lying in wait. They set a trap. They catch men like a cage full of birds, so their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they, grow, they have grown powerful and rich. They have become fat and sleek. They have also excelled in evil matters. They have not taken up cases such as the case of the fatherless, fatherless so they might prosper. And they have not defended the rights of the needy. 
Should I not punish them for these things? This is the Lord's declaration. Should I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? A horrible, terrible thing is taking place in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own authority. My people love it like this. But what will you do at the end of it? We see that the sin of Judah was great. But despite their sin, Brother Matt, God had given them a man. A man named Jeremiah who came in amongst the people and he walked the streets of Judah and Jerusalem and he proclaimed, Thus saith the Lord. He gave them the word of God every time it was given to him. Sometimes it was hard for Jeremiah to give them the word because there was often times that Jeremiah's head was on the chopping block when it came time for him to prophesy. But Jeremiah knew that he had no choice but to say what God would have him to say. And so Jeremiah would go and he would prophesy and he would preach and he would teach. But the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem were against him. And the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem wanted to kill him. They hated him. They did not want to hear from the Lord. Despite Jeremiah continuing to preach, these people, they wanted false prophets. They wanted false hope. They wanted to hear that everything was going to be fine. They wanted to hear that everything was going to be hunky-dory. They wanted to hear that everything was going to be prosperous. That all their sin didn't offend God. Instead, their sin pleased God. And that's all they wanted to hear. They didn't want to hear the truth that God is going to judge you because of your sin. They did not want to hear the truth that your national rebellion is great and it has kindled the anger of God against you. And He's coming against you to drive you out of this land. Instead, what did they say? They stood back and they said, Brother Bobby, we're the children of the promise. We're the children of the covenant. God would never send judgment against us. God would never send someone against us to take us into captivity. He's always going to watch over us. He's always going to provide for us. He's always going to take care of us. No way someone could penetrate our great walls. Friends, what happened is God began to bring judgment against them in the form of a drought. The drought was so severe that the Bible says in the book of Lamentations that the women were murdering their own children and cooking them in a fire to eat them. The drought was so treacherous that the Bible says the babies, their tongues were sticking to their mouths because they had nothing to drink. The drought was so treacherous that the Bible says that people were lying dead in the streets. And as the drought comes against them, God's judgment falling upon them the nation of Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar are coming down against the wall. And they're building ramps on the wall and laying siege to it. And all along the people of Judah, instead of repenting, instead of turning back to God, despite the judgment of God coming upon them, they continue in their sin. They continue to sacrifice to the Queen of Heaven. They continue to worship the Baals and the Asherahs thinking that, that Baal's the God of fertility and if we just please Him, He will, he will spread His seed across the earth. And they continue in their sin and their rebellion. And the Bible tells us that finally Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army, they penetrated the walls. And they took hooks and they stuck them in the nostrils of the Jewish people and chained them together and they let them out into captivity. And they burned the city to the ground. This city that was a jewel to the nations, this city that was a treasure of the Jewish people, this city that was a testimony to everyone. That great temple that Solomon built was burned to the ground, and as the city is burning, Jeremiah is writing the book of Lamentations out of the cry of his heart. And he says, we have sinned and we have rebelled and you have not forgiven us. God, all of these things has taken place is because of our national rebellion and you have not forgiven us and it's why your judgment is coming out upon us. Friends, could this not be a message for us today? We see it all burning down and collapsing around us. And instead of turning our faces to God and crying out to Him for salvation and repentance and awakening and a stirring and a movement of God, we continue to go in our rebellion and in our sin. And because of this, the judgment of God is coming against us. And friends, I believe it won't be long. The enemy is going to come through the gates. And we're going to suffer the same fate as the Jewish people. Say, oh, Brother Zach, that can't happen. Well, friends, I want you to know that every great empire has fallen. 
and when did they fall? They didn't fall, most of them, because somebody came from the outside. They fell because they were corrupted on the inside. We see their national rebellion. You see, friends, Jeremiah longed for God to forgive, for God to move, for God to remember his covenants with his people. At this moment, God, uh, Jeremiah was desperate for the glory of God to return to Jerusalem. Many of you today, you want the same thing. Many of you remember the days of old when God would stir and God would move. When people would walk the aisle on Sunday mornings and get saved. You remember what those tear-stained altars looked like. You remember days when people would gather together and they'd pray over a lost sinner and somebody would come to salvation. You remember those days. And you've been praying and crying out for God to give the glory back. To move once again in our midst. Your heart is overwhelmed with grief because you long to see him move just once again. That's Jeremiah. Jeremiah knows that the glory has departed because of their national rebellion. Secondly, he knows the only way the glory is going to return is through national repentance. As Jeremiah gazed upon the state of the nation that he loved so dearly, he saw the devastation and the destruction that covered the land. His heart was flooded with grief. If you'll look at Lamentations chapter number 2, starting in verse 11, you'll see how his heart was flooded with grief as he saw the nation, the city that he loved, lie in ruins. He says, my eyes are worn out from weeping. I'm churning within. My heart is poured out in grief because of the destruction, the destruction of my dear people. Because children and infants faint in the streets of the city. Go to verse 20 through 22. He says, Lord, look and consider who you have done this to. Should women eat their own children? The infants they have nurtured? Should priests and prophets be killed in the Lord's sanctuary? Both young and old are lying on the ground in the streets. My young men and women have fallen by the sword. You have killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without compassion. You summon my attackers on every side as if for an appointed festival day on the Lord's, on the day of the Lord's anger, no one escaped or survived. My enemy has destroyed those I nurtured and I reared. Jeremiah was in anguish over the state of Judah and Jerusalem as he watched it burn. He knew it was because of the sins of the people, and so he begins to urge them. And to recognize that everything that has happened is directly related to God's judgment. This is not because you are not pleasing the Baals and not because you are not pleasing the false idols. This is because you have turned against God. Look at chapter 2, verse 17. The Lord has done what He has planned. He has accomplished His decree which He ordained in days of old. He has demolished without compassion, letting the enemy gloat over you and exalting the horn of your adversaries. This is not because you're not pleasing these foreign gods. This is because of your sin that this has taken place. And so He says in those words of chapter 3, verse 40, let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. See, history tells us that the Babylonians came in and put hooks in their nostrils and let them out, but they didn't take them off. There was a small remnant that remained there in Jerusalem. The drought was still severe. Judgment had fallen. And Jeremiah Russell, he's still prophesying. He's still preaching. He's still telling them this is the judgment of God. Repent and turn back. And this is what they said. Jeremiah, you know, we had it pretty good when we were worshiping those foreign gods. There was rain on the land. There was food to eat. Our children were safe. But the moment you came on the scene and you started prophesying and you started preaching, the rain stopped. The food dried up. Our men, our women, our children began to die. Jeremiah, the only reason this has happened is not because God is bringing judgment upon us. The only reason this is happening is because we've stopped worshiping these other gods. 
And so let us go on and worship them. Let us go on and sacrifice to them so that they may please and they may pour out the blessings upon us. And instead of repenting and instead of turning back to God, what do they do? They begin to worship these foreign gods harder. Let's worship them more. Let's bow down. Let's sacrifice them. Maybe they will send us reprieve. Isn't it something that the city is burning to the ground? The temple has been destroyed. The glory of God has left. And they're still crying out to these foreign gods. And so Jeremiah, in his lamentation, he says, let us search out and examine our ways. The word for examine there is, is the word that means to dig. I think about little Noah. He likes to go out in the yard and play all the time. And Noah's always been a digger. He likes to dig things. A couple days ago, he come running in the house and he had something in his hand. He said, Daddy, I found treasure. Look what I got. Something was caked in mud. I said, what is it? He said, I don't know. So I took it over to the sink and I put water on it and I washed it off. And it was a hot wheel that he had buried five years ago in the dirt. <laughs> I don't think he was disappointed. He actually was playing with it afterwards. See, friends, the same principle applies here that Jeremiah is talking about. Let us examine our way. Let us dig. Let us dig down deep into our hearts. And let us see what sin lies underneath the surface that's unconfessed. Friends, this word needs to be heard across our land today. Everybody in the church this morning, if we're desperate for revival, we need to dig. I think about Moses. Remember Moses, he killed the Egyptian. He buried him in the sand. And what did he do? He took off. He ran away. For 40 years, he lived in the wilderness. And every time he thought about going back to Egypt, what did he think about? He thought about that old Egyptian that was buried back there. And he knew, man, if I go back to that land, I'm going to die for my sin. I can never go back to where that Egyptian is buried in the sand. And then God comes along and tells him, Moses, you got to go back. You got to go back to the place where that Egyptian is buried in the sand. Because I've got something for you back there. But Moses knew to go back meant that he was going to have to dig. He was going to have to dig up that unconfessed sin in his heart. And he was going to have to trust God to handle it and to take it away. And to take away the fear of those who would come against him. And friends, I want to tell you this morning, a lot of you have Egyptians buried in the sand in your heart. You've got something buried way, way, way down deep. Man, if anybody found out about it, imagine what they say. But in order for God to release the children of Israel from bondage, Noah had to dig. And he had to confess his sins. Friends, what if revival this morning, what if revival this morning depended upon you digging up those unconfessed sins in your heart and turning them over to God? What's Jeremiah say? Let us examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. What if it meant coming to this altar this morning and saying, God, you know that one sin that I've hidden for so long, I'm going to pull it out. And I'm just going to trust you to take care of it. Do you trust in his word? See, we'll hold on to these things. I want anybody to know about them. I'm not asking you to confess them to me. You don't have to confess them to me. I, I can't do anything for your sin. Confess them to him. But we keep them buried down deep for so long, they become just like that Egyptian in the sand, this festering, rotten carcass. And friends, today you need to beg him. You need to dig down deep and you need to beg him to forgive your sin. You need to hit this altar and repent. You need to turn back to God. And you need to beg him to take it away in the blood of Jesus and to take care of whatever lie underneath the surface. In order for revival to happen, 
Solomon heard these words in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple of sacrifice. If I close the sky so there is no rain, or if I command the grasshopper to consume the land, or if I send pestilence on my people, and my people who were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Friends, listen, don't turn to the world, turn to him. It's the only hope we have at this point. Can't you feel the heartbeat of Jeremiah? He was a desperate man pleading with desperate people to turn their faces to God because Jeremiah was desperate for revival. What Jeremiah wanted them to do was look around and realize, guys, this thing is burning to the ground not because... We're not praying to false gods. Instead, this thing is burning to the ground because of our sin. And the only way it's going to stop is if we turn our hearts back to God. That's the only way. And friends, that's the only hope that you and I have today in this land that we live for revival. The only hope that we have now is to turn our hearts back to God. We see national rebellion. We see a call for national repentance. But then thirdly, this morning, Jeremiah pleads with them for national remembrance. You know, friends, Jeremiah's life was not easy. He was one of the most, if not the most, ridiculed and despised prophet in the Bible. You go read the book of Jeremiah, and what you will find in his life are defeats, crushing blows, mockeries, and persecutions at all times. He speaks of this in Lamentations chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Listen to his heart's cry this morning. I am the man, he says, who has seen affliction under the rod of God's wrath. He has driven me away and forced me to walk in darkness instead of light. Yes, he has repeatedly turned his hand against me all day long. He has worn away my flesh and my skin. He has shattered my bones. He has laid siege against me, encircling me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who have been dead for ages. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I cry out and plead for help, he rejects my prayer. He has walled in my ways with cut stones. He has made my past crooked. He is a bear waiting in ambush, a lion in hiding. He forced me off my way and tore me to pieces. He left me desolate. He strung his bow and set his arrow against uh, as the target for his arrow. He pierced my kidneys with his arrows. I am a laughing stock to all my people, mocked by their songs all day long. He filled me with bitterness, satiated me with wormwood. He ground my teeth on gravel and made me cower in the dust. My soul has been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. Then I thought my future is lost as well as my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my homelessness. The wormwood and the poison, I continually remember them and have become depressed. His entire life, Jeremiah had been ground into the dust. God would tell him to do something. He was ridiculed. He was mocked. He was put down. He was persecuted. And Jeremiah says, I'm the man who knows affliction. I'm the man who knows heartache. I'm the man who knows what it is to have a heart of bitterness. Because I've seen it all, I've done it all, I've lived it all. And now not only that, but this city that I love so much and these people that I love so much have been led into captivity and the glory of God has departed. And then Jeremiah says in verse 21, Yet I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's faithful love. We do not perish, for His mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say the Lord is my portion, therefore I will put my hope in Him. You see, what Jeremiah had learned through all of 
those trials and tribulations in his life was one truth. God will deliver those who trust in him. God will deliver those who fear him. What does he say? We do not perish. I put my faith and my hope in him. In Jeremiah's desperation for revival, he knew one thing for certain. I've only already said it. God is our only hope. This past week was Republican National Convention. Tomorrow was the beginning of the Democratic National Convention. Friends, if we're putting our hope in Donald Trump, if we're putting our hope in Hillary Clinton, if we're putting our hope in the pastor of Second Baptist Church to turn this ship around, we're putting our hope in the wrong place. They will never turn it around. They can never heal our land. Friends, God is our only hope. If we're desperate to see revival, we will turn it all over to Him and allow Him to work in our midst. Only He can grant it. So what does Jeremiah say in verse 41? He says, let us lift our hearts and our hands to God in heaven. Our hands are lifted. The reason he speaks of his hands is because when you praise God with your hands and you lift your hands up high, you expose the palms of your hands. And by exposing the palms of your hands to the eyes of God, what you're saying, Lord, is I'm clean. I'm clean. There's no dirt, there's no filth found in me. And I've got my hands lifted and outstretched to you. And by lifting our hearts to heaven, we're saying, God, here is all I am. Everything I am longs for you. Everything I am is desperate for you. Everything that I have is yours. God, you take my heart. You use me. God, you take my heart. You lead me. You guide me. Whatever it takes, God, I just want to see your glory come back. Here I stand before you. How will you use me? I think of Isaiah chapter 6. King Uzziah has died. There's Isaiah in the midst and he, he sees the glory of God and what does he say? He says, I'm a, a man of unclean lips and I am ruined. And the Bible says that God sent an angel to touch his lips with a burning coal and then God says these words, Who shall we send? Who will go for us? And then Jeremiah or, or Isaiah says, Here I am. Send me. Our hands, God, our hearts are raised unto you. And God, we know this morning that you are our only hope at this moment. God, we can trust in men. We can trust in chariots. We can trust in armies. We can trust in horses. We can trust in our guns. We can trust in our weaponry. We can trust, to trust in all of these things to heal our land. But God, they never will. And so here we are at this little tiny place at Second Baptist of Great Falls with our hearts and our hands lifted high to you, God. And we're begging you with all of our hearts. We're desperate for you. And we're begging you, oh God, to heal this land, to heal this city, to heal these people from their brokenness and from the chains that they found themselves in, God. Our hearts and our hands are lifted high unto you in heaven, oh God. May you hear our cries. May you hear our prayers. May you heal our land, oh Father God. Amen. Are you desperate? Are you desperate for revival? My heart's cry. How bad do you want? <coughs> I remind you of these words. Let us search out and examine our ways. Let us lift our hearts and our hands to God in heaven. We have sinned and rebelled. You have not forgiven. How bad do you want it, friends? 
How bad do you want it? Russell Smith said last night at midnight prayer, he said, Lord, we know you've never moved until people are willing to show you that they'll sacrifice everything for you. How bad do you want? Father God, we give you glory. Give you honor. Pray. God, we're desperate for you. Think about that song that used to be sung. I'm desperate for you. We're desperate. You're all we hope. God, in seven hours, we're going to be underneath the tent on top of the hillside over there. Yeah, it's going to be hot. God, I'm reminded of those Christians in China who are meeting in caves today. They have no air conditioning. I'm reminded of those Christians in Iraq who are having their heads cut off this morning or probably in extreme heat. I'm reminded today that it probably wasn't 72 degrees and cloudy when you walked up Calvary. Lord, if we're desperate for revival, regardless of the heat, regardless of who might drive by in protest, regardless of who might get angry at the noise and call the cops, regardless even if an armed stranger walks in the tent to take our lives, if we're desperate for revival, God, we'll be in this altar this morning, We'll be there throughout the week. And we'll sacrifice our lives and our hearts today on this altar. Say, God, whatever it takes, just like Isaiah said me. Whatever it takes, Lord, with my hands and my hearts lifted to, heaven, lifted to heaven. God, I'm desperate for you to move. Desperate. It's the heart cry of a prophet. Revival. Repentance. Remembrance. God made you. If you'll stand at this time, James.